Hi everyone, thank you so much for choosing to spend your Friday afternoon with us. Uh, we hope this will be interesting and insightful for all of you. Um, you know, try and put all your questions in the Q&A tab and we'll tackle them at the end of the webinar. So yeah, let me just quickly kick this off by introducing our two panelists uh, who are with us here from the Epicamia team. We have Rahul Jain, who's the Chief Executive Officer. His role at Drums Food International, which is essentially the makers of brand Epigamia, is to execute. So he spends his day bringing to life the quirky and out-of-the-box ideas that are visualized by the rest of the team. And he began his career in finance, actually, working for Deutsche Bank's credit structuring team. And during his tenure there, I think he also spent some time in Singapore and in Hong Kong. He has also some experience in uh, starting an organic milk brand where he created an innovative supply chain for delivery. I think we'll touch a little bit on this later in the webinar as well. Prior to Epigamia, this is. And he has a BTEC degree in metallurgy and material science from IIT Bombay and an MBA from ISP Hyderabad. Along with him, we have Siddharth Menon, who is the Chief Marketing Officer at Epigamia. His role is to drive growth through strategic initiatives that bring the brand's essence to life across online and offline channels. And he drives awareness, experience, advocacy of Epigamia through an integrated marketing system and uses consumer-driven insights to influence the product's innovation and rollout strategy. Before joining Drums Food, Siddharth headed the North business for Colgate Palmolive where he generated market share growth through his work there. So yeah, before we, of course, you know, zoom into what we're all super excited about, which is the plant-based uh, dairy coconut milk yogurt, I think uh, we'll start off by just focusing on brand epigamia overall, right? Uh, so my first question to you guys is that it seems like you've taken something that's very um, quintessential in Indian kitchens, which is like the humble yogurt and made it very trendy from Deepika Padukone endorsing its easy health claim to it uh, launching in flavors like blueberry and mishti doi and, you know, selling 3 million cups on average in a month. How did you establish this new consumer habit and how did you take buying dahi and create this new category? Hi, Dhruvi. Uh, super happy to uh, be here and, and, and uh, interact with you guys and looking forward to this. Uh, but yeah, you know, at Epigamia, we... Uh, we're uh, activists of taste and advocates of health. And, uh, you know, for us, uh, we're always looking to push boundaries and unleash the best out of foods. And, uh, you know, we started off with a simple belief that, you know, there's something that we can unleash from dahi. We always felt that dahi is, is Robin to the Batman, is a little katori of, uh, to the big thali. And we said, no, dahi can be Batman. And that's how we wanted to sort of unleash the best out of dahi. We strained it, we made it Greek, uh, to the Greek straining process, we gave it higher protein. And we infuse great flavors uh, uh, in it. And uh, we put it out there. You know, uh, we were a small startup. Uh, we didn't have many resources. We truly believe that the, this Greek yogurt can be an amazing snack. And we put it out there in, in year one and consumers just lapped it up. I mean, the early adopters picked it up and they gave us a lot of information and said, you know what, this can actually be a great mid meal snack. Uh, you know, uh, we didn't have to talk to them. They just naturally, uh, you know, gravitated to it being a good mid meal. And ever since then, that's how we've sort of built the brand. Uh, the core is really pushing boundaries. The core is really getting the best out of your foods. Uh, the core is trying to make it as tasty as possible. Uh, and since we're advocates of health, provide multiple platforms. So yes, yeah, so we moved from Greek yogurt to smoothies to uh, unleashing the best out of ghee. And you know, just most recently, uh, uh, got onto the plant-based platform as well. Um, and that's really how we've sort of built our brand. Um, uh, our consumers are. Uh, thankfully very loyal to us and, and they sort of buy the whole sort of range. Uh, but yeah, it started with the humble uh, dahi and uh, ever since we managed to unleash it, we've sort of, you know, taken steps forward to try and see what other foods that we can unleash. And, uh, it's been an exciting journey so far. Right. And I mean, for a brand like Epigamia, it seems like distribution remains to be a key consideration, right, Rahul? And you retail out of 8,000 distribution points, if I'm not wrong. So how did you solve challenges around the same, especially with a, dealing with a product that essentially has a shelf life of around two weeks? I think a lot of our listeners would love to learn from that experience. Uh, thank you, Dhruvi. And uh, once again, uh, thank you guys for having us here. Super excited to be here. And uh, so, yeah, so I mean, uh, when we started out, obviously distribution was one of, uh, we, we had absolutely no background in FMCG until uh, Sid came along and decided to help us. 
uh, on that. So basically, uh, uh, so we went we went the traditional route uh, where or in you know typically in FMCG companies uh, from the factory to the distributor and then from the distributor to the retailers. Uh, that's the route that we took. But then what we realized was that the two absolutely non-negotiables for us. Uh, were uh, one the freshness of the product we wanted the consumers to have the freshest possible product on the shelf and the second one for us was the cold chain integrity we wanted to uh, to make sure that the cold chain integrity is maintained through and through and that is where we realized that uh, you know our uh, what what we want is not aligned with typically how the distributors work and that is when we decided that for us the consumer is the most important and uh, which is why uh, for uh, basically for both our non-negotiable points, we will do a, we will go direct. Okay, so that's when we took the tough call that uh, let's let's do this on our own, guys. Let's uh, let's just try it out, and that's when we decided to build our entire distribution network ourselves. So right from factory to the retail outlet, uh, we work with the uh, 3PL uh, providers. We have our own warehouses where we have cold rooms. We have our own leased vehicles which go on uh, uh, predetermined beats. To the vehicles, and that's how actually we were able to uh, to build our IP in our distribution, and uh, you know that worked out really well for us because uh, uh, freshness uh, is actually equated to uh, healthy in India, uh, and which which is why it was uh, it was absolutely paramount for us to do that, and and then uh, so once we once we gained and this we did in all our uh, top five cities uh, which are uh, Mumbai, Delhi. Uh, Bangalore, uh, Hyderabad, and Chennai. And then when we decided to expand beyond these cities, so what we did was that by then, uh, thankfully, the brand had certain pull and we were able to attract some of the best distributors in those cities who worked with us on our parameters. So with respect to how to store the product, how to deliver the product, how to maintain the supply chain of the product. So, so that, is how, uh, that is how we were able to work and that's how we grew our distribution. Super cool. Yeah, I think it makes total sense to expand out once your brand has a certain amount of pull and then, you know, go all out. That makes a lot of sense. My uh, other question was around this whole complex relationship on health versus taste. You know, um, Indians are quite complicated when it comes to their own perceptions of what really healthy is. And a lot of times there's this catch 22, especially for brands that are looking to enter the fresh category or the good for you category between playing with health and taste. So how did Epicamia deal with this whole catch 22 situation? Um, so like I said, we're activists of taste. And so there's one thing that we don't compromise on is taste. And you know, that sort of reflects the consumer as well. There's one thing that the consumer will not compromise on when it comes to food is taste. No matter what you throw out there, it can be as healthy, it can be the healthiest thing in the world. Uh, I don't think a consumer will ever compromise mm -hmm. on taste. And even if they do, they won't compromise on it for too long. But the, the, and I think that's, you know, to be honest, there's no confusion on that aspect. Where the confusion and asymmetry really sort of plays out is the health. Okay. And that's where, you know, when I think uh, if you go back to when we launched, we thought we were making the most amazing thing by straining Greek yogurt and getting protein, which is great. I mean, it's a great product it's high protein and you know when we went and spoke to some consumers and we said hey you know why are you consuming greek yogurt it's got protein yes the early adopters said yeah we love protein we want our eight grams we want our uh, per cup and we love that and we're going to consume that but a lot of consumers says yeah it has it's healthy it's inherently healthy so we were like you know consumers are not really playing out protein probiotics those things so what we realized is that as far as health is concerned i think it's people have different points of view. Some people want protein. Some people want for them. Health is, is about uh, portion control For some people. Health is about, you know, how many carbs they have. or don't have for some people. It's about uh, intermittent fasting. For some people it's about keto for some people. It's about plant pace. Uh, and you know, everyone has a different sort of connotation to health. Uh, and some people, you know, flirt between the concepts of health, but there's one thing that they do not flirt on is the fact that as far as MS Rahul alluded to this, as far as India is concerned, freshness is healthy. If your food is fresh, uh, it's considered to be healthy. And let's go back, right? I mean, at the end of the day, we're also used to eating a home cooked meal that the roti that comes out of the tawa must go straight into the plate. It must be hot and it must be fresh. So we're all sort of so conditioned to this. 
that now that we are going out and eating, uh, we're having our snack, that same demands of freshness is incumbent on, on, on the new consumption occasions as well. So there are two things that the consumer, I don't think, is very confused about. One is it's fresh and therefore it's healthy and taste will not compromise. As far as health is concerned, you know what? Consumers have different platforms and we must respect that. Uh, you know, everyone has their own sort of uh, reasons to follow a certain health plan. And that is something that Epigamia totally reflects it. And we therefore try and provide as many health platforms. But when we provide those health platforms, the two things we don't want to compromise on is taste and health, taste and freshness. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the other question I had was around just quick do's and don'ts for young startups. A lot of people attending today are people who are wanting to launch their own brands or want to learn from your experience. And what are, I mean, since, you know, it's been a journey, like you rightly mentioned, from the first year to now, uh, actually entering into these diverse categories, like even key. So what are like the five big do's and the five big don'ts that a young food startup should keep in mind while resuming these, this journey of theirs? So I think uh, I'll start with uh, one of the don'ts that we've uh, realized uh, over our course of the journey. And that don't is that don't get caught up in, uh, uh, in uh, market research, right? Endless market research. Because at the end of the day, honestly, nobody knows what the market wants and nobody knows what the market will like, right? So at the end of the day, what you do need to do is understand what your consumer wants, right? And once you figure out uh, and you have, you have certain conviction that this is what, okay, my consumer will like. So you just go out there and you, you adopt a fail fast philosophy. Let the market tell you that, you know, how well, uh, how, how, whether we like this product or whether we don't like this product, but just go with it, go with your gut. And, uh, so, so basically just, uh, don't be afraid to experiment, be, uh, uh, you know, be as innovative as you can, but don't compromise on the product. And also what your product stands for, right? For example, we were, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, we were very, very clear. What are the key things that we will never, ever compromise on? As Sid mentioned, uh, taste was one of them. Uh, the product has to be inherently healthy. The product has to be fresh, uh, right? Uh, so, so, so these are some of the things. So, so uh, everything else that we did was kind of built around uh, this, uh, this brand umbrella, under this brand umbrella. Then one of the things that we that I also uh, say is that just because I mean FMCG or any other industry has been doing something in a particular way for hundreds of years, so that does not mean that that is probably that is the that is the only best solution for your particular startup or your particular uh, business model as well, right? So never be afraid to experiment on that and always work out what will work the best for you. Right. And that is, that is where uh, everything, uh, when it comes to uh, make sure that, you know, it, it is consumer first for you, that, that should be the cent that should be the central point for all your, uh, uh, all your focus. And uh, so, so in fact, I'll just uh, give you an example of when we just started out, right? So these were, th this was our, uh, uh, this was in fact, uh, uh, just to let you guys know in, in a week from now, in exactly a week from now, we turned five. So we launched on uh, 19th wow. June, uh, 2015. And so, yeah, so when we launched, so we actually launched with six variants. Okay. And three of them were the regular variants, like a plain natural Greek yogurt, a mango and a strawberry. And three of them were the flavors, which we were the most excited about. And these flavors, we thought that we were revolutionizing the Indian uh, yogurt industry by actually by the Indian uh, snack, fresh snacking industry by launching flavors like Khatta Meetha, Minty Chaat and Imli Chutney. And, you know, so, so we thought that we'll go the savory route. And so, so, you know, in, and everybody had their favorites in office and we used to love these flavors. We just thought, okay, fine. We'll just from a portfolio perspective, we'll have the mangoes and the strawberries and all, but these were the, these were our uh, dark horses with whom we were uh, betting on. Right. And in one month, the market told us, what is this? <laughs> this is, this is absolutely <laughs> not something that we want. Please guys take it off. And in a month, we, we immediately realized that this is what the market is telling us. And, and in a month, we just took off those flavors completely and we immediately launched other flavors. And since then, so it, it just, uh, it just completely, it, it, it just experimentation that you have to do and with, with a bit of conviction, with a bit of consumer research. And right. once you do it, just uh, basically let the market tell you what they want. 
So these are some of the things I think. uh, Yeah, if I can ask you to elaborate a little bit more because you made a very interesting point about quickly realizing that the market doesn't like something and then pivoting. How difficult is it at that point as a young startup to talk to investors or to talk to your team and figure out, um, you know, from logistics to storage, how, how, how do you pivot? How is it possible for you to pivot at that point then? Yeah, I, I think Ruby, that's an excellent question because uh, see, whenever you launch a product, right, there are a lot of things that go behind launching a product. There is a lot of raw material that is procured. There is a lot of packaging material. Then factories have to set up something, etc. So, so which is why, I mean, it is not an easy decision, honestly, right? But so it, it is simply a case of whether you take out the bandaid slowly or you just take it off in one shot, right? And you have to, so, and yes, these are difficult conversations that you have to, uh, that you have to uh, have with all the stakeholders in the system, not just investors. There are other people also, for example, even the, even the factory guy, the production guys, right? We, we work with contract manufacturers. You need to have these discussions with those guys also. Then you need to have with your team who's, who's worked very hard to procure all the things required for those products. But I mean, you, you have to ultimately, you have to just show them that uh, what kind of, uh, uh, what kind of, why are we doing this? And if, if uh, the investors are actually in line with what you're doing and they have confidence in you, they will understand that what we are doing is actually, see, because ultimately you can keep crowding the shelves. You can keep crowding the uh, shelf with more and more and more products. But I think a better strategy is that you just keep putting your best products out there and you keep removing uh, what products you think are not going to be uh, your, your long-term uh, best. Yeah, interesting. Not easy, but I guess necessary at that point. So exactly. yeah, thank you for that insight. So that anything to add there in terms of do's and don'ts, any major takeaways for listeners? No, I mean, I, I wholeheartedly sort of, um, I mean, Rahul and me have gone through this journey of, the pressure to take quick decisions, right? I think that's super important. I think very often we are, uh, I mean, the, the classic scenario is, is this uh, savory yogurts. It's great on a strategy deck. You know, I think I presented to Rahul the second time saying, Rahul, this is it, man. We're going to launch a jalapeno yogurt uh, and, you know, we're going to give it with barley puffs. And, you know, this is our flavor profile. We're going to start with fruit and then we go to savory, then we go to fruit blend. It's all great. But if it doesn't work in the market, take a quick decision to pull out. And it did not work. And I think... Uh, uh, we've learned uh, very uh, quickly that the, uh, the quicker you take a decision, the lesser the, uh, the potential damage. Yes, you might have taken a wrong decision. Maybe jalapeno yogurt would have done exceptionally well if you waited for another three months. But in normal situations, when you chart out uh, consumer feedback in the first two weeks, you get a sense that this product is not uh, going to cut it. And I think we built a system in place where we are able to sort of fast track pulling out the stock or uh, you know, at least not producing more and replacing it with something that we think uh, uh, will fit the shelf better. So uh, we've always got an innovation pipeline to fall back on. So it's not like if this doesn't work, that we have nothing else to fall back on. So have a good innovation pipeline to fall back on and keep activating. So my single piece of advice is uh, a bad decision is better than no decision very often. Mm-hmm. Uh, because as it, as it go along, you'll realize that it'll really help you. And of course, listen to the consumer as well. Right. So now to, uh, you know, shift the focus of our conversation to distribution again and talk about this play between Kirana stores and modern retail. And we're all seeing the situation evolve as we speak due to the whole COVID-19 scenario as well, where now there are new modes of distribution that have suddenly become so popular. So any comments there and how should young brands again approach this entire interplay? Yes. So I think, uh, see, the situation has, I mean, we are, we are uh, living in unprecedented times. None of us uh, ever expected uh, such a situation uh, uh, to ever be upon us. Uh, so uh, we, we've all, obviously, the, uh, the supply channels, the channel strategy has to adapt and has to change. Because even going forward, we don't expect this to be changing anytime uh, soon. The, 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 uh, what the changes that have happened. For example, earlier, I'll talk, I'll just give you a bit of a, uh, uh, what we used to do scenario pre COVID. And so there uh, effectively modern trade used to be a channel, which was, which was great for brand building. That is where the discoverability of the product was the highest. Uh, you had huge shelves uh, with, with open chillers, you know, 
you could sample your products out there uh, with with uh, with promoters and that's how that's how uh, we we've built our brand make no mistake i mean our our brand uh, our business has been built upon getting people to try the products and because we have supreme confidence in the quality of our products right and but going forward now i think that this is it's going to be a very different uh, channel mix now that's going to happen especially from a distribution uh, perspective modern trade is still going to uh, exist but in a much much smaller uh, it it will have a much smaller role than it used to have uh, earlier uh, one of the key channels that will actually emerge now is actually the new which i call the new age uh, e-commerce so i mean uh, we, we yes we do have the swiggies uh, uh, the the big baskets and the amazons but now people like a swiggy a dunzo uh, then uh, people like uh, even geo for that matter right people like a zomato so now these are new entrants who are coming into the market who are going to completely change the supply dynamics of uh, of the way that people actually are ordering and uh, shopping and 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 people are uh, uh, people will be looking to have as little contact as possible but uh, because now they will be spending a lot more time at home so they will be wanting uh, you know fresher and healthier products they will be looking at uh, exploring that and so 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 that is one second yes on the kirana so kirana uh, i i feel that during this uh, so i mean pre covid there were a lot of people who were uh, who was who were not uh, who were kind of uh, you know betting down on the uh, kiranas with respect to losing their significance i think uh, in the covid scenario the kiranas have bounced back and how they've shown that they are the at the end of the day they are the guys who are uh, who who are going to be there no matter what happens and i think that channel is here to stay and in fact but, but a very interesting thing that will now happen is the a digitization of the kiranas and the gts that is now going to start and a lot of people are actually now, now a lot of startups uh, even even p- uh, big players like geo are trying to do that which i think will make this platform very very relevant in the time to come so that's on the supply piece i think sid can uh, comment more on the demand piece yeah i mean i think um, uh, you know there are a couple of codes of uh, behavior that have got heightened uh, from the consumer standpoint i think number one is uh, uh, is protection right and protection has led to i think two behaviors that i think to me are super uh, important to notice one is of course health and health specific to immunity we're all moving from reactive to preventive i think immunity is becoming a big play i get a concussion every day uh, which i believe has got geloy in it uh i have no idea what it is but apparently it's a wonder immunity uh, uh, age old uh, thing and just like that there are enough immunity options and supplement options that are playing out number two people are not going to step out too much so people will want uh, deliveries home uh, yeah. a lot more and i think there is where the uh, local kirana guy has really stepped up i mean i know there's a kirana guy in our house who near our place who used to service only bread and milk I mean, he's going to serve his cocoa powder to you. He's going to get a Coke can for you. He's going to get you the best of chocolates. He's able to source this, and in his captive audience, sort of increase the sortment that he normally sells into. So I think, yeah, Kirana will play a huge role because of that consumer need. Uh, I think the second reason why Kirana plays a much bigger role is also consumers are realizing that that's a trusted source. I can yeah. call the guy and I can call her, him or her, and you know what? He's going to deliver that for me. Uh, I think we're going to see that, and that's why, uh, from my uh, standpoint, I think. Uh, uh, the kirana the retail store your neighborhood store is going to gain more significance and e-commerce um you know uh, again if people don't want to step out then uh, they will resort to uh, people delivering home uh, and we're already seeing a lot of uh, you know rahul spoke about digitization and and talk e-commerce there's another trend i mean there are some of these big box retailers who are now taking trucks and going to the consumer so they've set up these massive stores uh, but you know they have, they're forced to go to the consumer and sell because they're not coming to the store uh, so yeah the, the retail yeah. environment is going to change uh, and it's already changing a store yeah, on even even, uh, even uh, just to add on uh, to that on the modern retail uh, you mentioned uh, modern retail uh, yeah. Andrew. so even on that front uh, there are a lot of changes happening uh, even the modern trade guys are actually adapting uh, to the situation and they are going big on their own online platforms Correct. so that's also that's also become now a part of the new age uh, e-commerce now so all these big guys like a reliance or spencers uh, nature's basket they're all going online and in fact they're using their stores as uh, uh, fulfillment centers 
for the product so uh, so the, the guys uh, the logistics guys will come to their store they'll pick up the product and then they will go and deliver to the customer so even they have jumped onto the online bandwagon and i think them that's that's going to play a big role for them also going forward true um the other question that a lot of young brands have is about naming so one thing is knowing your consumer who this person is the other thing is what do you call your product um you know now that we've covered how to get the product to the consumer so now let's move on to what do you call it and so that any insights on um focus groups or how do you really go about naming a certain product um if there was a playbook for this ruby i'd make a lot of money and a lot of investors be knocking on my door but really there is no playbook for naming uh but it's an interesting exercise that one must get in i don't think there's a defined way to do it yeah. uh the way we sort of do it is is uh, uh so from a brand name i think it's really what you feel uh the brand needs to be there and once you know what you feel then decide between the names that you have is which is interesting which plays the category codes and so on and so forth uh the name epigamia came in because uh, you know rohan who's the ceo was is essentially from uh he's an indian uh, uh but born in america uh, and working in india so he's a lot of east meets west and epigamia is the best of civilization a merger of civilization and that's how he came up with the name uh so that's how it is and it's stuck so people you can call it epigamia epigamia ep- epica whatever you want to but it sticks you know people get it and uh, you know we're not too fussed about it but then when it comes to the category name that's a little more complex that's a little more technical you need to know what consumers uh, speak uh, what do they say what will they recognize uh, how will you want to disrupt um yeah so naming is 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 an exercise but there is no defined playbook you know i think it's got got to do something with gut and your understanding of the market and the situation that will yeah. deliver it yeah. so far totally it's been the work for us yeah yeah i totally agree it's just a work in progress always naming <laughs> Okay, now moving on to the thing we're all here for, which is the newest launch. So I'll leave it up to you guys to describe the new product and to take us through the journey from conceptualization to now early sales, I believe. So yeah. So yeah, let me go. So uh, like I said, you know, we are activists of taste and advocates of health, and we very cognizant of the fact that there are multiple health platforms, and as a pegamia, uh, we need to. Uh, uh, provide uh, as many platforms as possible to our consumers um and uh, we figured that here is a platform where we can try and uh, unleash the best out of it um, get taste going and uh, yeah so for us it's about taking this platform taking the sources of plant based uh, it's a natural extension of um, the kind of products that we're making which is yogurts and drinkables we said you can make plant based yogurts and plant based drinkables uh and that was the simple brief that we came with our head and and chef has turned out uh, you know he came in one day and he said guys i have uh, got a coconut milk yogurt yogurts and uh, we tasted it and we loved it um uh, and for us it just made so much sense uh, we know there are a whole bunch of consumers who uh, uh <clears throat> really want a plant based option uh, some of these consumers even stopped consuming our uh, greek yogurts because they wanted a uh, they wanted to move to plant based lifestyle um but as we've sort of progressed and as we are learning i don't think this product is only for the plant based and vegan consumers we're seeing that plant based being a strong permissibility even for those who are not leading a plant based lifestyle and i think there is uh, a play there as well Uh, and that's how this product uh, came out so it really is epigamia's way of saying you know what we recognize all sorts of health platforms uh, what we are about is taste and what we are about is freshness and how can we bring taste and freshness to this platform that's already existing and how can we make the best out of it uh, and chef came up with coconut milk yogurt uh, he's got two versions unsweetened and coconut jaggery i've tasted fruit flavors ones as well and i can tell you they are out of this world Uh, and we just can't wait to launch them it's going to take a couple of months but uh, uh we are looking forward to those and yeah so that's how the plant based sort of conversation started and and we've got some very uh, interesting ideas behind even getting to drinkables uh you know uh yeah so those are sort of plans in the annual but these are the first two pieces of the uh, little cups that we launched uh, about 3 4 days back and we're super excited we've already got some good feedback so we're looking forward to Uh, for more people to consume this and and let us know what they think congratulations it's an exciting time new products five years it's it seems like a huge time at the company so Thank you. Uh, 
speaking of packaging someone just mentioned in the q and a there about the fact that the packaging looks great and i agree the one thing that you see right up front and center is of course the coconut itself so yeah. just had a question around why coconut like why was that chosen to be the base of this product so from a, a standpoint i think coconut has a lot of resonance across the world and especially in india from an ingredient standpoint we found that coconut is is the one that sort of gave us the right texture and the right taste and uh, you know for us it's about unleashing the best out of coconut right uh, so yes there's a plant based story but we're looking to unleash the best out of coconut and i think cook there's a goodness of ingredient story there uh, uh, which is what we also wanted to play out along with the plant based bit and which is why coconut is straight up front having said that we're also looking at uh, other sources uh, which is oats and almonds so those are sort of the three sort of uh, spaces that we're looking to play from a source standpoint we thought the the good face up front would uh, that we want to start off both from a texture and a taste standpoint coconut seemed to fit the best uh, and from a consumer acceptance standpoint there's a really this goodness of coconut it just seemed to make sense for us uh, they all sort of fit in and uh, just to add on to that i think purely from a taste perspective we want this product to be for everybody and i think that uh, this product just uh, stand alone uh, even for people uh you know who are uh, consuming our uh, greek yogurt also i think this product will be something that even they will love and uh, so so not only the vegan community obviously for them uh, this product uh, we hope that uh, will be very good but even for the for the entire community in general uh, we we hope that just on the basis of taste they will they will love this product too and that is going to be our philosophy for all the products that we launch in this range uh, even going forward and there are some very exciting products that we are actually working on uh, that we will launch i think uh, uh, said mentioned some fruit flavored uh, coconut yogurts i think those are uh, going to be the uh, earliest that we will be launching and i mean honestly they're just mind blowing the product yeah i'm excited yeah. to try all of them um <laughs> i had a question about your thoughts on the category in general so i completely agree uh, plant based products shouldn't be limited to just vegan consumers um you know of course everyone across the spectrum can enjoy and i think will enjoy these products so what do you think are the biggest challenges and opportunities when dealing with a category of plant based and where do you think this is headed in a country like india which is of course complex in its own ways wherein we have you know um 30% vegetarians almost which is the largest vegetarian population anywhere in the world but also a very large non vegetarian population so this whole myth of india being purely a vegetarian country is also wrong so looking at all of these nuances looking at india and looking at your product where do you think the challenges and opportunities are and where do you think the future of this category is um, yeah, so uh, i think on this yeah so so see it's uh, we were honestly speaking i mean we were not uh, i mean uh, uh, about a couple of years back we were not very confident and uh, we were not sure about the scale uh, the scalability of the product and uh, you know the the distribution potential of the product because uh, uh, when you when you have a certain distribution infrastructure in place so the products that you launch and it it takes as as i mentioned earlier it takes a lot uh, behind any new product to uh, to be developed to be produced and then to go out into the market so which is why we were we were kind of spec, uh, skeptical about that but then in the last two years the kind of uh, the kind of brand uh, uh, the kind of brand pull that we have started seeing from people the kind of uh, trust that the people have actually put in us as a brand to come out with the quality products with good uh, with good tasting products i think now we feel confident that uh, these products will actually appeal to a wide range of people and which is why now we are very confident that this is no longer uh, this is this is this is a category that is uh, waiting to go very big okay and as i mentioned earlier uh, we feel that this category uh, that uh, you know uh, as said mentioned we are uh, uh, we don't uh, we are advocates of of, uh, of health uh, so uh, so which is why we want uh, what we want to do is we want to appeal to the a larger community in general uh, and that that we will achieve through uh, awesome tasting products and that is uh, that is how we will always and always approach this category true and the other big part along with taste and accessibility is also price so how did you approach pricing for this particular category yeah i mean uh, i think from a standpoint on pricing i think it's always uh, two two levels of i mean structurally the way we look at pricing and, and that pretty much across most product categories that's how it's done Uh, so fundamentally, the way it works is you look at a cost plus approach and you look at the market based approach as well. 
the end of the day, it must make business sense uh, for you to sort of drive uh, this going forward. Uh, so you take a cost-based approach and you take a market-based approach and you arrive at a price that uh, is ideal to service the market. Please understand that I think uh, from a standpoint, uh, the demand for plant-based products, while it is growing, it's still minimum. It will continue to grow and we think it's one of those fads that's not going to go away because it's based on a contemporary morality, I think. Um, at the end of the day, and that morality is going to continue and continue to be stronger. And while that gets stronger, our ability to service the market also is going to be not that easy because we have to distribute uh, at large places and, and provide for the long tail. So that's the way we look at pricing. We put in all the variables in and say, what's the right price to ensure that at the end of the day, there's a business model that can sustain to service uh, the set of consumers that are spread far and wide uh, in this country. So, Yeah. I agree. In terms of, um, again, about this specific pr product in general, did you feel like um, there was an issue with naming or how did you approach regulation and, uh, you know, FSSAI regulatory bodies? Was there, you know, any insight there? So none whatsoever. There is still some asymmetry as to how the plant-based regulation and what we should call them in that sense. And we're happy mm -hmm. to sort of work uh, with them to say what's the right name. Uh, uh, there's even conversation whether it's plant-based, dairy-free, how do you sort of use it, where do you use plant-based, where do you use dairy-free. There is some, I think, work that the FSI is doing and, uh, and we've also submitted some recommendations uh, from RN. Um, so yeah, we're working with some of them uh, to see how best we can name them. And like I said, we'll get into a consensus of what the names need to be eventually. But Right. There were also a few questions around uh, shelf life stability and storage conditions and whether they differ for plant-based categories as compared to your dairy products. So, so see, shelf life, uh, uh, mm -hmm. shelf life and uh, shelf uh, stability varies from product to product, right? And uh, even so, for the, uh, for example, for the Greek yogurt, uh, which is uh, uh, so over there, uh, the the shelf life is actually lower than the plant-based uh, yogurt. So, for example, for a coconut milk yogurt, the shelf life is actually uh, that we're going in with is about twenty-one days, whereas for the Greek yogurt, it's about fifteen days. So, which is why it's it's completely product dependent. It depends on what's the what are the technical specifications of the product. How can the product uh, sustain uh, the heat shocks, uh, etc., that are bound to happen uh, when it goes uh, into the retail outlet and from there on to the consumer, and then after that, what are the changes that will happen in the product uh, 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 composition? So, basis that shelf life will completely differ from product to product. That's super interesting. A lot of people actually mistakenly sometimes believe that newer products or innovative products, especially in the plant-based space, may have a shorter shelf life. It's encouraging to know that it's actually the other way around and each ingredient thus differs in the way the product is uh, formulated. Um, okay, I think I've already started taking a few audience questions as and when they made sense compared to what we were talking about before. I'll continue on that line and just take a few questions um, just give me a moment. Yeah, a lot of questions have come in about probiotics and uh, the decision to add them even to the plant based line and just in general, how important are they to the Indian consumer? So, uh, like I mentioned, I think uh, uh, immunity is one of those sort of core concepts and platforms that are being built. Uh, you know, I think the probiotic platform has got a lot of relevance. It has had for the last two, three years, there have been some players who've really been playing that out. We're also sort of believers in the probiotic space. Uh, it's another platform that we're going to sort of invest in. Um, and when Chef gave us an opportunity to say that, you know, we can also put probiotics in this product, uh, we just lapped on it because that we think that both plant-based and probiotic are going to be strong platforms for the future. Uh, you know, we, we even have a separate line of probiotic products that we are working on. Uh, which we're super excited about. So we're really, uh, like I said, for us, um, uh, each of these health platforms are important and we want to provide products that give us, uh, uh, that give the consumer the choice between these platforms. Uh, and when Chef gave us an option of putting probiotics and plant-based, we said, yes, absolutely yes, because these consumers are seeking uh, probiotics also in their products. So it'll be good to give them that option. Right. Uh, I know you mentioned a little bit about this earlier, but when it comes to protein, we're seeing a lot of launches, right? Um, I think there were around four times the launches of uh, high protein claim products in the last few years than we've seen before. So uh, what is your take on this? Like probiotics is one definite pull or marker. 
on the other end there's protein do you think indian consumers really understand protein uh, and yeah your thoughts on the same um do they really understand protein uh no do they really think they need protein probably yes uh, so we think that protein has two plays there are uh, again there are consumers who really seek protein uh, they seek protein post they work out they know exactly how much protein they must have in the day they are measured in the terms of saying you know i'm going to have two cups of dal i'm going to have chicken i'm going to have an egg and i'm going to have greek yogurt so on and so forth to get my protein to, uh, uh, intake uh, but a large portion of the consumers have understood that protein is good for you so for them it's permissibility right that that's at play saying that oh is me protein hai to acha hoga right uh, so protein as a language is picking up um, as a uh, do they know enough and more about protein maybe not but as a language is picking up and therefore we're seeing it at play with regards to permissibility people are saying oh is me protein hai to acha hai so it must be good and therefore we think that also is a is a is an important platform and uh, we're seeing consumers talk a lot more about it right um the other question that we're getting a lot is on again cold chain and access to distribution channels access to machinery access to technology in a country like india when you're looking at new innovative products and how do you sort of deal with wanting to be cutting edge and then also seeing what the local ecosystem can provide and the balance that one has to strike then yeah so i think uh, see that's that's a tough one um, there uh, uh, about 5 years back when we started uh, when we started out cold chain i mean uh, the the situation of cold chain now and then is vastly different i think uh, a lot of people have come in and invested in cold chain now and uh, situation is is a lot better than what it was 5 uh, years back and uh, honestly i don't think that people will have to struggle uh, so much uh, as we had to which is a good thing because uh, this is because uh, uh, cold cold chain fresh uh, short shelf life these products are here to stay uh, and uh, uh, this is what as i mentioned these are uh, we feel that this is uh, a category that will be one of the fastest uh, growing categories uh, across uh, uh, all fmcg and which is why so uh, for for us uh, now on so so there are two parts to the uh, to the entire uh, supply chain one is the primary transportation which is from the factory to the uh, to the warehouse or the distributor and then from the distributor to the retail outlets so which is why uh, for 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 now for the primary transportation that is from the factory to the distributor there are now many options available on the cold chain side and these are all 3pl uh, providers okay so uh, so all third party logistics guys like a snowman a coldman a coldex cal so, so a bunch of them and which is why i mean once you have competition in a particular industry so there uh, uh, a you get better service and b uh, you get more cost effective cost effective also so there the problem is uh, uh, i mean the problem is much lesser now and you have a lot more options on the second piece which is from the distributor to the retail outlet yes uh, there is still a challenge over there on that front uh there are people who are now interested in getting into that uh, that piece also basically building out a cold chain network or distribution within the city as well uh, so hopefully even that should get resolved in the next uh, uh, one one year one and one and a half years as of now uh, it is some bit of a challenge but going forward hopefully i think even that should be solved that's encouraging to definitely note um the other big thing that startups struggle with is actually two other big things one is uh, hiring how do you look at hiring in a young startup and you know what lens should entrepreneurs take and the other is um, you know investors how to attract the right kind of investment how do you keep uh, expectations in check especially during a time like covid and uh, yeah how, what what are the implications of working with an fmcg major like then on in your case so i think uh, first i'll uh, take the hiring bit uh, so uh, the hiring bit is actually very very tricky and you know so so and and as at various stages of a startup the type the kind of people that you want uh, uh, need to be very different right when when you are an early stage startup right over there the the kind of the kind of work that you're doing is actually very very different from uh, from what you do when you become slightly more evolved and your systems and processes are slightly more set because in initially it will be completely chaotic it will be ad hoc you will be doing one thing and as i said i mean you will just be pivoting to the next thing etc so you need people who are who can act, who can adapt to change who have a very entrepreneurial mindset who are quick on their uh, uh, quick uh, quick on their feet uh, and you know and uh, 
their self starters because honestly i mean nobody knows uh, what they're doing and and you're just experimenting all the time right so which is why which is why you need people uh, who are who are extremely passionate about what they're doing uh, and uh, uh, you know who who have th- that kind of belief in in what you are trying to do so which is why that is very very important at the beginning and then going forward when you become more uh, uh, more evolved your systems and processes become uh, so you know when, when you uh, when you scale up to a particular level that is the time when you should uh, look for specialists because especially let's say on the finance side on the marketing side uh, on the supply chain side so then you you require more specialists because in that phase you require that processes and systems uh, need to be set because then that is when you go for the long run so so because those those processes are what will help you uh, to uh, to scale up from uh, 10 to 100 so and and then from 100 to 1000 also so so that's why i mean it all depends on what stage you are at now coming to the investors piece i think uh, this is uh, super critical and this is actually according to me one of the uh, most important uh, things for any young startup to do it is uh, so i think uh, it is uh, so obviously it is super important that the investors like you but uh, i think it is equally important that the entrepreneurs also like the investors and it is very important to gauge the uh, the uh, mindset the time frame of the investors the expectations of the investors their feedback so so you know so that there is a match and so when whenever there is a match of understanding there is an alignment on the business plan on how you want to proceed and uh, uh, you know what kind of uh, how do you want to run the business so that is when it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful uh, uh, thing that happens when when both the investors and the entrepreneur is aligned so which is why uh, my suggestion to actually all budding entrepreneurs would be that please be very careful in selecting your investors and obviously they have to like you that's uh, that's uh, primary but it is very important that you also like them and that there is 100% alignment in the thought process and the way you want to build out the business yep thank you those were great tips uh, rahul um the other question and i'll just end you know i think we are down to our last two questions so the other thing i had in mind was about at home application so a lot of times when a company is formulating its product uh, they're imagining a certain use case right or they're imagining a hypothetical consumer journey but a lot of times when we've spoken to brands they've come back and said that on their social media the first thing that they see is a lot of people saying we used it in this way we had it uh, you know turned around we had it for breakfast instead when when it was supposed to be a dinner product so people are really uh, experimental and very creative with food and they like having their own take so while developing a product how do you again solve for like a wide case of functionality and what do you think especially when it comes to the plant based category where this can head yeah so you're right i mean people are uh, uh, floating within consumption occasions uh, make no mistake about it but i think you should also look at the core consumption occasion uh, for each of your products so for us greek yogurt has always been a great with meal snack but having said that a lot of our consumers consume it as breakfast and uh, some consumers consume it as a post meal a light dessert uh, i think that the choice you should leave with the consumers but be rooted to a particular consumption occasion um is always a recommendation so that a communication can be clear which is the lead consumption occasion so for example when we when we did the research on greek yogurt 70% of the consumption of that sorry 65% of the consumption was a mid meal snack you know between the 11 to 12 or the 5 to 6 but a good 30% of the consumption was uh, breakfast um uh, or dessert or even a post uh, workout so i guess each consumer has his own sort of uh, way but as long as you know the core users and what their users are Uh, then uh, you should be rooted to a consumption occasion, and then let the consumer decide as they float, uh, which is, I think, justifiable and, and absolutely fine. Right. Uh, looking towards the future, what else can we expect? I know you mentioned food-based, um, more food-based applications in the plant-based category. Anything else that you'd like to share with us? Um, you know, what are the other products you're playing around with in the space, or look exciting at least right now from the outset? So yeah, we're. Uh, Uh, we're a super restless company. We love launching new products because there's a whole bunch of products that Chef creates, and, and it's great. But I think from a plant-based, yes, the fruit-based variants are something that we're looking at. Uh, drinkables is something that we're going to start work on, and hopefully we'll be able to find uh, a good uh, uh, product that we can throw out there. 
but yeah, within the plant plant based range, even cheese is something that we want to uh, work on um, and see how we can get there as well. So. Super exciting. So I'll just end with asking you how other startups can collaborate with you. I remember having an early conversation where you guys said that you love talking to other food startups, helping them in their kitchen experiments and with your food lab. So yeah, any thoughts there? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, my point is that, you know, we're, uh, we don't, I think from a, from a standpoint, Epigamia, we, we are, we're good at managing a sort of cold chain business. Uh, we understand the taste, we understand the palates, uh, but the plant-based bit is a different value chain. Uh, you know, we're, we're also learning and we're happy to sort of collaborate with other startups uh, early on or, or late and, and find options to sort of drive this value chain forward. Uh, that's the intention with regards to ingredients with regards to uh, product, go to markets, uh, you know, how do you get to the consumer? I mean, we've got some expertise to some level of it. Uh, but like I said, the plant-based consumer is a unique set of people. How do we collaborate to get to them together? How do we collaborate on ingredients? How do we look at the value chain right up to like, you know, even sourcing coconuts. Uh, so there are many, many places that, you know, we'd uh, uh, not really love to help, but also uh, would love to learn uh, to improve our value chain and business models as well. And I think that's a exciting space for us. Uh, it's a new avenue for us. Um, and we're looking forward to uh, talking and chatting and collaborating with the whole community uh, to see how we can get better at this, uh, for sure. And how we can contribute as well. All right, great. So I think we're, yeah, we've made good time. We have two minutes to spare. So I'd just like to thank both of you for, you know, taking out this hour. Uh, we've all learned a lot, including myself. Um, and yeah, thank you everyone for listening in. Thank you for putting your questions. I hope I've covered almost all uh, categories, at least that were mentioned within the questions. And uh, yeah, we'll see you all again during our next session, which Shardul will be in touch about. And uh, yeah, good evening. Have a good weekend, everybody. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you again, Dhruvi. Uh, true pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Shardul. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank everyone. you, Bye. Bye. Thank you, Varun. Bye. Bye. Bye.